certainly uh, some questions. Um, thank you all for three uh, outstanding talks this morning. Uh, this question uh, specifically for Dr. Hu and Dr. Miller. I, I think when you, you look at the, the rollout of, of cancer surgeries, at least for things like colon cancer, endometrial cancer, certainly the, the uptake was slow. And I, I think not only is it a technical issue, but I think there was also the very real concern that, that these operations may impact long-term cancer mortality. And I, I think these types of operations are different than a cholecystectomy, where really you're just looking at 30-day complication rates. And I think when you look at, at prostatectomy, we see that 60, 70 percent of people are already going robotic radical prostatectomy, really with very minimal survival data that, that's available. And I think that's certainly a bit troubling. Maybe you could comment on, you know, going forward, how we could better uh, align data before the, these operations really become so widespread. comment first and just speak loudly. So I think that uh, we pointed out earlier how uh, the uh, pharmaceuticals industry So robotic surgeons can't operate the microphone here as we can clearly <laughs> see. But, uh, but I think earlier the point was made that uh, pharmaceuticals companies I think have, have deeper pockets to fund some of these studies. We of course in and surgery uh, have some, I think, device registries, clearly not in, in a robotic, surge, robotic prostatectomy, but I think that, that that probably is where uh, the, the future lies. And we've seen that with some orthopedic devices. I think that um, uh, what's going to come out in prostate, we're going to see again, which is recently there was a talk of uh, uh, rolling out HIFU or high intensity frequency ultrasound. There's partial ablation of the prostate, prostate cancers uh, with laser therapy. And that's all going to happen in the next five years. And so I think, again, there's a lot of uh, hype around these therapies, uh, a lot of enthusiasm from patients for a, a, a silver bullet that's not going to affect uh, functional outcomes. Um, so uh, the, the story is going to repeat itself. That's okay. Well, I would just, I guess, answer that question in two ways. First, I mean, the point is very well taken that the emergence of robotic prostatectomy, you know, uh, in many ways happened with a, a paucity of data at best. And... Uh, you know, there are all kinds of new paradigms to think about how to do this. I'm certain that someone this afternoon or tomorrow is going to talk about the ideal framework for in introduction of new uh, technologies. And, it, you know, those are really kind of significant models to use and try to implement. Um, so there are important lessons learned that hopefully will be, move, you know, will be implemented moving forward. From the specific perspective of cancer control, um, you know, I can speak both from my own experience and then from, from what the data say. For me, Compared to doing this operation open, and Jim mentioned tying down the anastomosis basically blind, you know, the decisions you make intraoperatively around how much tissue to take um, in an area of concern where the tumor is located, there was haptic feedback that exists with the open case that you lose. But for me, the dissection is an order of magnitude more purposeful with robotics just because of the visualization, the lack of blood in the field. And the amount of variability from one case to the next is much less, whether you measure that as operative time, blood loss. And so I think that that helps. There's, there, we've looked in our own data in the music registry and margin status really, you know, it, it is, it is no different between the two. And you might argue that the open cases now are selected. But, um, uh, but the long-term cancer control will be very hard to understand the implications, not only because it's a fairly rare event with, with many men who undergo prostatectomy, but also because there are new trends in the use of adjuvant radiation therapy that have evolved during this time period. So separating all that out will be hard, but certainly the lessons for the future are important. Yeah. Maybe I could add a little detail. So Dr. Whalen convinced me, and I did do some reading for this, that laparoscopic surgery is good in the sense you get out of the day, hospital a day earlier and it makes a certain amount of sense. It seems to me the data on... I'm sorry, what? Oh, that, that I said Dr. Whitlin convinced me that you get out of the hospital a day early if you get laparoscopic surgery, it makes sense. The data on robotic prostate surgery, I'm convinced you like it better and they're nice pictures. There's not a, any data that I read that shows it's any better. I'm sure you like it better, but this idea that people survive long, or men survive longer, or they're more potent, or they're less incontinent doesn't exist from the data you show. Even, even, even the cherry pick data, and it's 
not reasonable to think that there's going to be a long-term difference between radical prostatectomy, however it's done, assuming it's done competently. And when you add in the confounding skill sets, if you look at a place like Memorial, where they all, I'm sure, operate a lot, there's a lot of intersurgeon variability, it's going to be impossible to show it's better. I, I don't, I just don't see it. And it sounds like there's no plan to study it. In fact, it sounds like it's penetrated the market to the point where it's going to be done, whether it's better or not. I just thought that would get the discussion going. <laughs> I, well, the, glo the gloves are going to come off now. But, uh, <laughs> but I, one, of, one of the slides that I didn't show that I, I'm sure David is well aware of is uh, Marty Sanders' PROSQA study. And, and early on, it wasn't a, a main intent of the, the study, but he, he looked at uh, six high volume centers across the country. And there's a nice slide which shows the, the variation in blood loss and length of stay and operative time in the robot. And it was actually a comparison of robotic, laparoscopic, and open. And the robotic surgery actually decreased that variation. It pulled all the tails in very tightly. So I think that there was consistency that that, that study showed in terms of at least uh, delivering care. Now, in terms of some of the other things you're mentioning, um, sexual function and so forth, um, again, this is preliminary data measured with uh, uh, quality of life instruments. One could question, well, what's a 10-point difference really mean in terms of uh, functional status recovery? Uh, but um, but I do think that uh, the, the ability to make these comparisons, one, isn't, isn't uh, available here in the United States and many parts of the, of the uh, developed uh, world. Um, you know, using an analogy, I think that, you, again, you say that the user thinks it's better, but, um, and it's kind of one of the things that uh, David and my mentor used to always say, well, this is a first, first world uh, issue. But if you just think about the example of an iPhone, for instance, I mean, I, I presume most people in the room have gotten the every, every two years you get the, the five and the six and the six plus and so forth. I mean, is that incrementally better? But yet we, we as consumers will pay that amount of money to do that. And uh, in the United States, you know, a, a 10 point difference in terms of sexual function or per patient perceived or surgeon perceived superiority uh, will lead to, unfortunately, the use of these robots in a, I would argue, a, 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 appropriately so, a very unregulated yeah. fashion. I, I just argue that there's no convincing evidence that there's a 10-point difference in sexual function. These patient-reported questionnaires, I mean, really, you know as well as I do, you have to do sleep studies and really, if you really want to measure erectile function, so just... Well, anyway. I, I would say that there's a huge psychometric field of measuring these patient reported outcomes. So I'm not sure I would dismiss them kind of offhand oh, no. with, with, with that. But, you know, I think you're right. It's fair to say that because it's a better surgeon experience doesn't mean that we should widely adopt this technology if it, if it costs more. Um, I think the early studies based on claims data, uh, you know, um, have limitations that, that we've all discussed. And they tend to compare people who've had a very long established experience with with open prostatectomy, with the early experience with robotic prostatectomy. How we're tackling this, at least in the state of Michigan, we, we're now kind of implementing an in infrastructure across all practice settings. So we talked this morning about the complexity of understanding care delivery in a small rural practice. We're implementing kind of electronic patient reported outcomes via email to patients at baseline three, six, and 12 months. We're hoping that will give us some perspective data allowing comparisons with granular clinical data to go with it, although it's not randomized. But I think there is still a need to define these, you know, these benefits, although I think it will be, it will be difficult to kind of turn back the clock on this no matter what. I'll let Dr. Whalen come. Uh, this is a highly, this is a, you know, it's a difficult area to discuss, but I think the fact that it's already, the horse is out of the barn for the urology for prostates, which is, so now we're saying we can't go back from that, it does not make it right necessarily to, 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 to uh, recommend it. I mean, I, I mean and, I, and I, listen, I was at the very beginning of the minimally invasive thing, so we took tomatoes being thrown at us. You know, we had a lot of criticism against us, and we had to come up with data, and we were able to, to come up with enough to justify it. But, but I, I just, if you, if you broaden the discussion to the, to the other areas where there are minimally invasive and alternatives there, like for re rectal and for GYN and things, where, where, you, where, people, where enough people have gained the skills that we have penetration of 50% already on laparoscopic methods, whether or not the incremental gain that's, that is that is being being uh, 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 you know that it's thought to be there by the proponents and with without any evidence supporting it or evidence that's, that goes the other way, it's very hard to to see how we can justify in a, in a economy that is so strapped to to, to pay for health care in, in a time where we're seeing you know the the the, the strain that the systems are are undergoing to then say we're going to add this you know invest in these robots and and, and, and train people on this. Um, uh, when there is a cheaper alternative there, and it's not that in the perfect world that we could not get to a place where this might where it might be some benefit. But we have not shown it yet. And I think it's 
hard now to, to recommend this uh, in other ways. For you guys, I think, I think you're dealing with it in a responsible way. You're trying to do the best you can with this and try to come up with the data. And, but I think the fact that you, you mentioned in one of your slides that you have 1,500 cases to get to the point where you'll have a benefit in terms of, uh, main, of, 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 of continents or, or of 1,200 hits. Those are big, big, big numbers with this. And so um, I, I think it's a, it's, it, this is exactly what happens in America. You look at the rest of the world, we don't see this penetration in the rest of the world. And I think that because they start with the economics and they, then they go, then they go, let's, they, we won't let you do this. You know, it's, it's a, so we have a different set of problems, but I think we have to be very careful as we, as we look at the real data and say what is justified as, as we move ahead and may, perhaps trials are the way to do it. I mean, it is not perhaps, it is the way to do it. We have to find some funding for it and then come up with the data first as we're able to do with the colon part. Yeah, I, I guess just at the risk of not wanting to come across as an advocate, but rather as a scientist, and, and it's hard. Um, all right. Um, you know, the cost issue is really important. The initial view of the cost was what is the cost to the hospitals? There was this, there was this you know, huge upfront investment in the robot and then the disposables and all those exist. And so it's a more expensive operation from the hospital perspective. I think if you look at it from the payer perspective, I also, this other collaborative I'm involved in, in that generates 90-day episode costs for common clinical procedures, which has become increasingly relevant in joint replacement and likely to be in other areas. If you look at those kind of using some price standardization and risk-adjusted episode costs for 90 days for robotic and open prostatectomy from the payer perspective anyway, you know, they're, they're pretty much a wash. So again, the hospital incurs more costs and how that trickles down you know, I think I'm not saying that robotics is less expensive. The data say it. I think it's important to look at it from a number of different perspectives and over a different time horizon as we try to understand the real implications of this. Patty. So, uh, Patty Gans, UCLA. So, great discussion, but I just want to kind of bring us back to the whole issue of delivering quality care. And I kind of see several different themes here. I think David mentioned that maybe there are only 10 cases on average per year done by urologists in this country. And we know that most urologists are doing all sorts of benign procedures and other kinds of things. And if you're doing only 10 cases a year, and it's the same for breast surgery, six cases per year being done by general surgeons, how can you be expected to have the skill set to be able to do that? And if you're just learning how to use the robot, and it may take you 10, 15 years to get up to that, does it make sense for us to allow any surgeon who says they are qualified to do this kind of procedure in terms of what the patient experience is going to be getting in terms of the quality of care. So I think this is one, I think, substantial issue of how, if you're in all in tertiary centers, that's great, but that's not where most Americans get their cancer care. The second point that I wanted to make is um, the issue of training. And I think you know what you're doing in Michigan in terms of training surgeons and kind of proctoring them and so forth is really what we need to be doing. Because when I think about myself as a physician, an internist, medical oncologist, I gave up doing certain things because 20 years after my original training, I didn't know the latest antihypertensives and the antibiotics or whatever it was, the internist could do that. I'd take care of the cancer. How are we going to deal with retraining surgical workforces as these new interventions, you know, if they are in fact better, how are we going to teach the old dog new tricks and make sure that they come up to speed? And are those young guys or girls who are coming out of surgery today, they may have the newest technologies, but they don't have the years of experience that the folks out in the field are. So how do we manage this tension of a volume experience that the mature surgeon has with innovations which may or may not be valuable? And that's, again, a very kind of you know, big, broad question, but I see that in terms of the delivery of care being a major challenge to have a workforce that over the lifespan can deliver on good quality care. Okay. I, th yeah, I think you've, it's a huge, hugely important point. I mean, if we look at rectal cancer, we're trying to teach, there's another new method, several other minimally invasive methods I didn't go into that are entirely interesting and intriguing. But again, the average number of cases of a colorectal surgeon does is five or six slow anterior resections a year. The places at Sloan Kettering, they have huge volume. But the point is, we have no way in the U.S. of, of trying to corral that volume into a center. In Canada, there's ways to do it. In Britain, there is. In, 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 in Holland, in places where they have a national health system, it, it's, it's possible to do it much better. But I, I think right now the problem is that it's a fee-for-service situation. We can't, at our institution, I, we can't get the few people to do two low interior sections a year with horrible results to stop doing it. We, the chairman tries to stop them, but they say it's a strain of trade. There's all kinds of DR, you know, uh, RVU-related issues, motivation, and I think you're absolutely correct. Well, I mean, I think as a consumer, I would want to know that the surgeon I was going to had some results that I could see. You know, what were the last 100 cases and what were their results? 
how many have they done? Uh, and I think, unfortunately, with cancer, unlike other conditions, the patient is in crisis, you know, and they, they're going to go to whoever they get referred to, and they're not going to take the time to do that. But I think in terms of delivering quality care in this country, we need to know that the operator and the hospital and whoever is delivering that bundle of care has a quality product. It doesn't matter if it's costly, if it's high value. The problem is that, I mean, I couldn't agree more, but the only, if you go to, I was at Columbia University for, uh, for 20 years, and now I'm at Mount Sinai. The only people that have databases are the, those that pay for them themselves. They raise the money to hire the, the FTEs to get the data, to call the patients. And so we have these silos of, of data. But you go to the system, you say, we need to know what, what is the, people don't know what the results are. They have no idea what the results are. And so they think we as a country, we need to find a way to make that a priority. And I think you're absolutely right. You should be able to say, this is my results in my last hundred of these, a thousand of these, so the patient can say uh, that, 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 you know, they make a choice. But I mean, the patients aren't even give, aren't that isn't even, they aren't even aware of that in, in most cases, which is the frightening thing. Yeah, I would just amplify both what Patty and Dr. Whalen said. And I, as I said, I would extend it to radiation oncology and to medical oncology. Try to find out the outcome of a, in medical oncologist. It's impossible. You just can't, you can't do it. You don't know what you're getting. And I think, again, it gets to the organization of healthcare in the United States. It's, uh, there's a lot of RVU pressure, even in the universities. There's pressure to do things, economic pressure. Um, I, I don't really know what the answer is, but well, I think there are two. Uh, so when I was a fellow at UCLA, I got, got great mentorship from Patty. So when she speaks, I listen. But I think that there are two things that have come out recently that are highly controversial, but that speak to this point. One is kind of the um, commitment or announcement by three academic institutions of implementing just strict volume standards for a host of procedures. Now there weren't, there were some cancer related, some complex um, GI cancer procedures, pancreatectomy, I think, and esophagectomy that were there. And it's a, it's a significant political issue for some of the reasons that Dr. Whalen, you know, um, mentioned. Um, and I was giving a talk on our work in Michigan at the European Association of Urologists meeting. And, you know, there is a very long tail of prostatectomy volume in the state of Michigan. There is a small number that do a lot and then a large number that, do, and they, you know, the response there was kind of like, well, it's very easy, right? Those, that tail just doesn't do the cases. And, you know, that's kind of an approach that I think in the short term gets you as quickly as possible, perhaps to a better population level outcome. But what we also know from the heterogeneity of, of, out, of measuring outcomes is that some people, for some reason, whether it's intuitive, whether it's technical skill or what it is, actually have very good outcomes at lower levels and there's much to be learned from them. So I think it depends on your lens a little bit. If you want it from a policy perspective, kind of volume based thresholds may work and may get you there quickly, but from a quality improvement perspective, there's something to be seen from being able to see both sides of the, you know, both sides of the tail. But to the public or, or to the knowing what your surgeon's outcomes are, I mean, just this week or last week, I'm sure most people in this room are aware of this ProPublica release of data from Medicare claims on patient outcomes with complications after a host of operations, including radical prostatectomy. So my Medicare outcomes as measured by their complication rates are there and, you know, there is a growing trend toward this, and I think to d just dismiss it because you don't like it is not the right approach, but I think there's a much broader set of outcomes that need to be looked at there before that's taken as the final answer. But I think there are movements in, in the directions you're talking about. I'll just, if I may, I'll just make uh, two quick comments. So one is, um, again, having recently been at UCLA under Patty's mentorship, uh, I, uh, I would just say that you know there are health care systems like UCLA where there's uh, more focus on uh, time-derived activity-based costing, you know, purchasing the primary care uh, uh, practices along the 101 corridor to prepare for population-based health. And so, so, again, that's getting away from the traditional fee-for-service paradigm, which the ACOs are forcing away, uh, us away from. So, you know, as a surgeon, as a healthcare system, when that happens, and it will happen, um, maybe not in the Upper East Side of New York, but... Uh, but uh, one will see the, the self-policing within surgical departments and, and the hospital administrators happen. You know, these, the active surveillance, the low-risk disease, which I think is now appropriately being followed by active surveillance increasingly, you know, that's going to go away. And robotic prostatectomy, probably a lot of that is going to come out of the, the patient's pocket where it is uh, outside the United States, for instance, in countries like China, where the, uh, the, insurance don't, the insurers don't cover it. Now, the other thing I'll just mention Finally, like I think David mentioned this a little bit, and he's he's been kind enough to hand this off to Kurshid Ghani, is that uh, you know Kurshid is spearheading 
an effort to do the, the uh, kind of, a, a, I think, eventual evolution into a pay for participation model, which Berkmeyer described, and I'm sure you're w well aware of, David, where there's, uh, using the Delphi uh, method, a lot of high volume surgeons across the country are trying to identify critical steps of the operation, you know, agree on terminology, how to grade each step, and hoping that that eventually uh, leads to uh, better outcomes so that you don't have to do a thousand to quickly be where you need to be. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the things that are on the horizons that's going to improve uh, th this process. Yeah, one point, I, I think that we're having a surgical discussion. The last session was on radi radiotherapy methods. We're going to talk about other cancer treatments as well. But I mean, the thing is, so we're, we're, we all have to sit down the ta at, at a table and divide up the shrinking pot of money for this. I think we have to figure out how we're going to do that. I mean, that's the, I think there could be a, a time like in our institution where I'm now where they're very cheap to be honest. They're, they're trying to, they're trying to cost contain in every way where we said we wanted a robot. So I could perhaps, you know, get some experience on that and others as well. And they just said, are you kidding? They said, you do 500 procedures on that robot you have, and then you can come talk to us about this, because right now you're losing money, and it's all about that. And there are systems around the country where they've done that. But I worry more about, you know, we sit down, we have a cancer patient's life at, in our hands, and, and we have the, each treatment modality has its benefits. And in and, and, and the case of, of prostate, it's the most difficult one, because there's so many different ways you can go. But in places where you have the standard paradigm of surgery, then maybe neoadjuvant therapy, and then adjuvant therapy, or one or the other, or both, you know, how do we value this and how do we how do we figure this out? And I think this is going to be the challenge is that they're going to dump this on each system's head to say, here's the money for sixty thousand dollars for a rectal cancer patient's life. You figure out how you deal with it. And I think that's we're going to have to make some hard decisions that they make around the world that we had not made in the United States before. We just say this new technology looks great, but we can't afford it right now. And I, I and I and this applies to to all of the different specialties. And I don't know how the heck we're going to how we do that, but I think that's where we're going to. That we, may, we may have to be facing soon, and it will be a different kind of discussion as opposed to saying I need another $50,000 instrument that I know will help me a little bit and I make a business plan that makes sense. But these are, I think, the real challenges and why this is such an exciting gathering of people, because we all, each of us have our area, and then we have to jump back and look at it 50,000 feet and see what's going on. I think, I think the final thing, if I may add, is that, I may add is that the, uh, even the, the, the device manufacturer is becoming more conscious of this. We, you know, they're giving certain NY, uh, New York Presbyterian hospitals these spreadsheets this, that demonstrate, you know, uh, assumptions on their part about the, the, uh, the pricing and the, the uh, profit structure of the hospital that, that show that certain operations like a robotic inguinal hernia repair are just not uh, sustainable and that they're, they're in the red to begin with. I think robotic nephrectomy or radical nephrectomy for kidney cancer is also in that group. And so I think that there is more cost pressure that uh, even the device manufacturer is aware of in their attempts to help us better select, you know, which uh, procedures are, are appropriate and which ones are non-starters to begin with from a, from a profit standpoint. Uh, anybody else want to comment or say anything? Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to kind of drill down. I'm sorry. I'm David Beyer, a radiation oncologist uh, now in Sedona, Arizona. Um, I want to drill down on, on some of the things that you were just saying and, and, and go back to some of the slides we were looking at, you know, 10-year SEER data on uh, robotic prostatectomies tells me that those patients are very early in the learning curve. Um, we face the same challenges with that learning curve in radiation oncology and in urology, and I, I would say to some degree, this one, you know, the, this, this horse may be out of the barn. Um, but the question is, how, how can we learn a lesson from this? How can we design trials that would help us to, to prove the next technology when that technology has a steep learning curve, when the people who are, who are popularizing it are just figuring it out as they go? Um, and then we need to, we need to have the follow-up to, to look at end results that are meaningful. Um, you know, per, per, perhaps not in urology, but perhaps in, you know, head and neck surgery, perhaps in some other area. How can we learn a lesson from what we've gone through with the robot and with a lot of uh, things in radiation oncology as well? Well, I mean, I can take a generic stab at that. I think it's a, you know, it's a really important question, and it's probably going to take a lot of kind of discipline and, and um you know, the system we work in doesn't necessarily encourage that. And the best framework that exists, and I suspect someone will talk about it in detail in one of the sessions, is this ideal framework that was proposed by Peter McCullough um, with input. You know, it came out of the UK or initially. The main major papers were published in a series of 
papers in the Lancet, and it basically describes from kind of the early innovators to the kind of post implementation surveillance for new surgical procedures and what you need along those lines and different variants of pragmatic randomized trials. So there's a framework for it, but it's, you know, it, it, if you just read it, thinking about how that would play itself out in our healthcare system is a significant challenge. So people have thought about it. I think there's a framework that exists. I think it's the discipline to move the next new technology through that. That is a big challenge. I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on that. I mean, I, th I think, I think we as surgeons in particular, you know, um, Anthony used the, uh, it was funny, the, the, the analogy, you know, the Colossus, and I'm, all, I'm always impressed by my radiation colleagues when they say RTOG and then a series of four numbers after it because there's a randomized controlled trial then. Well, you know, again, we, we unfortunately don't do that, and uh, one of my mentors used to say, well, when in doubt, take it out. And so, so I think that we, we unfortunately have that um, in our DNA, if you will, and, and so uh, not someone that likes to be regulated, but I mean, clearly there's a, there's a need for regulation when you think about the, the learning curves, the sacrifices of patient outcomes and, and so forth made along those learning curves. And, um, you know, it's above my pay grade to think about those things in, in uh, D.C. to do that, but there are places like Canada where they, they only, because of the limitations in the funds, they buy uh, 10 robots at, at the onset, there's centers of excellence, there's only three surgeons, two surgeons that can use the robot. Uh, so uh, there's some inequity you know, in terms of how that rolls out, but I think that that was done certainly more thoughtfully than in our, in our free market economy, uh, medical care fashion. I would just think that we start with databases. We need to have really good long-term data that we don't have now, and I think this is going to, I don't know how we do it other than uh, uh, mandating it. I and mean, I think this is something we really, you know, the, uh, as a as a as a uh, profession and also you know as a country, we need to figure out a way to do that. And I think there there would not be it's not it would be it's doable, but it has to be made a priority because I think that we'll, we have to start with 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 the with the, the results and we don't have it right yet. We have thirty day results. We can get that. We have NISQIP, but we've shown that and ACS has done this. They they now have this NISQIP database, which is which gives us a lot of huge numbers on on procedures in terms of thirty day morbidity mortality, which has allowed us to greatly change the way we practice. And you see with numbers of 30,000 operations, you can see things you otherwise won't see. We need to extend that out further, and this is going to be expensive. And it's going to, but I think that that's, that will allow us to begin to get some of the information. I think the truth is we really don't know uh, beyond the, the small trials that, that, that are done where we, where we do follow them out five years, and then, we, then we're lost. So, uh, Jim Moller, Roswell Park. I look at this a little differently. If you need all this stuff y'all are proposing, these huge databases, and you spend all this money, there's obviously not much difference among the different methods of taking something out. And patients prefer minimally invasive, and I think there's some de evidence that minimally invasive, where possible, is better. So the other part that you haven't talked about yet is I'm amazed after just 16 years that the robot has proliferated so widely. And yet, there's been very little innovation because we're talking about the robot. We should be talking about many different robots. And there are robotic uh, platforms being developed in Korea, Japan, and two in Europe. And yet, we, they've all been stifled by the single vendor in the United States being the sen single, trying to be the single vendor for the world. So is there anything that should be done or could be done uh, to uh, create some competition in the development of robotic surgery so that we can advance faster than we're doing by relying on a single uh, manufacturer of the robot to allow us to innovate. I'll answer it. It's not even clear we need one robot. So why? <laughs> I mean, this idea, so this idea that about doing better surgery goes all the way back to Alcon class in the 40s, where he did this dissection of skin flaps, and there was going to be local recurrence in breast cancer. There's intrinsic limitations to all these local therapies, and maybe it, 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 to be minimally invasive, you don't necessarily have to be robotic, right, or, yeah. or, or modifications on the robot. And I think this is a you know, a manifestation of our economic system. As Danny DeVito said, it's the United States, whoever dies richest wins. And I think that's sort of <laughs> permeated the healthcare system. I mean, I, I would just add, I have to, def you know, because uh, David and I both use the robot, I would just defend the fact that 
I mean, I think your point is well taken, Jim, and I know you're, a, you're an experienced open surgeon who transitioned to robotics, and, and we all wish that there was another competing vendor, uh, but in, in our healthcare system, we reward innovation. We see this for, you know, for the pharmaceuticals companies in terms of how long those patents, uh, um, you know, it takes for them to expire. Uh, we heard a little bit about how that differs for the devices. Uh, so I think that that, you know, someone needs to think about obviously that, that challenge, how we need another competitor. I would just uh, add, and you, know, you can see why Ralph is such a good moderator to kind of stir things up, but, uh, but one, one, one area that we didn't talk about was kidney cancer surgery, which we as urologists do, and the, the challenge in really in analyzing that whole category of surgery for comparative effectiveness is that you know, SEER doesn't code the, the precise size of the tumor. There's endophytic versus exophytic. There's the differences in vascular anatomy, but without question, and I'm sure this study is coming underway from Danny Makarov or from uh, David's group there at the University of Michigan, the robot has enabled us to offer minimally invasive partial nephrectomies to patients that previously would have either go gotten open radical nephrectomy or um, a laparoscopic radical nephrectomy that then downstream leads to uh, chronic renal insufficiency and so forth. And I'll let David speak to that because he's, a, uh, he's done a lot more than I have in terms of looking at kidney cancer surgery. But So I, I'm just trying to contrast your, your assertion, and I know it's somewhat facetious that we don't need any robot whatsoever. And, I, and I, I think that, you know, the truth is, if you look at broadly at cancer surgery, and I, you know, the literature is huge, but I tried to not just focus on urology, although it tends to be what we've been talking about up here, but thyroid cancer, for instance, there was a huge push to kind of implement robotics. And if minimally invasive surgery, right, is designed to kind of take a painful incision, as Dr. Whalen said, and make it less painful. But, you know, a th a, a, an incision for thyroid cancer is obviously significant, but it, you know, it, it's, it, it is not an, a, a large intra-abdominal incision. Many patients who had a thyroidectomy already went home the day after their operation. And now there was an attempt to bring robotics into that field. And in fact, the, the surgeon, the endocrine surgeons at our hospital tried it, didn't feel that it offered any benefit and stopped doing it. So, you know, it isn't that there's, you know, that no matter what, this is moving down the, the path. I mean, I think there's some thoughtfulness to it. And, um, you know, it, 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 uh, in terms of the, the you know, the, co the, co the competition and, and what that does, um, it would help certainly from a cost perspective and an innovation perspective. How you make that happen is, as Jim said, kind of above our pay grade. If, if the robot was miniaturized and there were multiple ones customized to the different operations, I think you would find this argument go away. Yeah. They would be cheaper, and they'd be more appropriate to the use. But you still need data. You need to show a benefit. You've got to show something over the, is, I mean, I think you're right. It would be, it'd be easier to develop it. It would be maybe cheaper, but you've got, to, you've got to come up with some data showing it is better than what is already there. Yeah, I, I don't mean that you don't need some data. You wouldn't need as much data because we wouldn't need thousands of cases to show a difference of 1% in something. Any other comments? Yeah, over here. Yeah, there is a side, this, Ralph, there is, you have a visual field cut or something? There is a side <laughs> of the room over here. Yeah, it's like <laughs> left side of hemi and hemi field cut. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, was, I have to say, I was struck. The pre, the, I learned a lot from the presentations yeah. this morning. This was really uh, very exciting for me. But I was struck by, the, by the, the difference between the single institution or the big SEER Medicare type data versus the randomized controlled trials, in which the randomized trials tend to show no difference, but the, sing but the other sorts of analyses that were presented seem to show a difference. And so I, I'm concerned that, that, we're not co that we're not doing the appropriate propensity analysis like Grace was talking about this morning to make sure that the arms are balanced when you're doing the single institution or, or SEER Medicare sorts of analyses. If, the, if they're showing one result and the randomized trials are showing a different result, maybe we're not, uh, we're not uh, correcting appropriately for them. That was my one question. My second question is that we've gone through the whole morning, and I know in all the medical oncology studies I read, we're always talking about quality-adjusted life years, right, qualities. I didn't hear any discussion of qualities this morning. I just read in the JCO uh, an issue or two ago that the first use of Avastin is $500,000 per quality, and first and second line use of Avastin is $1.2 million per quality. And those sound like amazing numbers to me, yet we still see Avastin used. But in any case, uh, is there a way to, to use quality-adjusted life year or some other kind of generalized analysis that let us compare uh, the results of different approaches? Uh, I think I can get to that for you. 
Uh, yeah, I think there is, sure, absolutely. I mean, it would be, uh, for example, a year's potent uh, or years incontinent or uh, maybe in the colon, you know, uh, in some measure, incontinence, yes, right? Yes. I mean, Later. whatever. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great idea. And you're right about the disparity, Ted. I think it's very good to pick up on your point. I'll just mention, I'm just going to tackle the first part of the question, which is um, comparing the uh, observational data to the randomized control trial data. And I have to be careful because uh, Memorial is literally right across the street from Wild Cornell New York Hospital. Uh, but, um, but certainly, I think that the, the, the comments that Indy Gill made and, and that I observed as well, which is at Memorial, you have fantastic open radical cystectomy surgeons. Um, uh, and you have, I think, fantastic robotic-assisted radical prostatectomists. But you have to ask yourself one question, which is, after their randomized control trial, which showed no superiority and lacked no benefit for, for robotic cystectomy, well, you know, I know for a fact, because our trainees rotate there, that they continue to do robotic-assisted radical prostatectomy, robotic-assisted partial nephrectomy. So, so, again, your point about a randomized control trial and propensity score analyses, better balancing for observational data, you know, as you mentioned, observational studies, you can only adjust for things that are in the database. However, again, I would just point to the fact and what's been said already with that randomized control trial, well, we know that there's a difference in the relative surgeon experience, yet it's a randomized control trial, and that's not a, that's not a, a variable that's really being adjusted for. So, so I think that's, again, when you, I think the difference in randomized control trials for drug delivery, for instance, placebo versus drug A, or five milligrams of drug A versus 10 milligrams of drug A, there's not very much variation, but here, for again, and going to why there's so few randomized control trials in surgery, you know, even when the RAZOR study or these multi-institutional studies come out, the, the, the biggest determinant of outcomes isn't whether you use a robot or not. It's the experience and the, the heterogeneity in the surgeon. And so I think that's the reason why there's these differences that we see and it, that are difficult to reconcile. But I'll, I'll let David speak to the quality-adjusted life years. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's a good point, you know, the, kind of the utilities analysis that looks at both how long you live and the, both the quantity and quality of that life are, are needed. They're scattered in the literature, but nothing systematic. So that would give you some lens as to where does this fit compared to giving someone an aspirin after they've had an MI. And I think that would be a, a, a good addition to the literature. In terms of the tension between randomized trials and observational studies, I think that is, you know, kind of an ongoing problem that's a tough nut to crack because we don't have the resources to do an RCT in every situation. I think Steve showed the parachute paradigm in, in his talk. And, um, and then on the other hand, what I've found is when you do an observational study, even if it's really well designed and implemented and you use propensity scores to adjust for things you can measure in the study, or you take it the next, next step and there are health economists here and you do something like an instrumental variable analysis, which, suppose, which is supposed to coax almost randomization out of observational data, kind of making that analysis accessible to clinicians who live in the world of randomized control trials is difficult. And so people un want, they, there's a hard, it's hard to connect that to the clinical field where the computational complexities are, are, are you know, make it somewhat opaque. So it's an ongoing challenge and there is often disagreement between the two. I didn't want to miss anybody on the left side of the room. <laughs> Tina. Hi, uh, Tina Shi. So my question is about the current state of technology diffusion for robotic surgery. Has it gotten to the point that for a hospital not to have a robotic machine, it's an indication of they're a low-tech hospital, therefore under business pressure, they kind of feel obligated to bring in, just to buy a machine, so that when people ask, they say, yeah, we do have a robotic machine in-house. Because if that's an issue, then, then a lot of the, uh, the concern we're talking about is going to get worse over time. Again, a very uh, appropriate and challenging question. I think that I would point, uh, point to my recent experience in Los Angeles and how you know Harbor UCLA, which is one of our training sites, you know, even has a robot now, and, and uh, the county hospital has a robot. And so that, while that's not the case across the country, I do think that in some specialties like urology, for instance, where you've seen such high penetration uh, of, uh, of the robot and, and certain technologies, as a patient, uh, this is a very patient-driven phenomenon. And so... If you're going to a hospital where there's not a robot, you likely have staff privileges at hospitals that do. And so I think that's the way that I would try to politically skirt that, uh, that question about the conception of whether or not the hospital is high quality or not. However, you know, I, I typically in these talks will show a slide that U.S. News and World Report hospital rankings, which you know, all the hospital administrators 
across the country are holding their breaths, although they know where they stand and it's embargoed. Um, you know, years ago, the, the robot was on the cover for that issue, you know, synonym, synonymizing, if you will, healthcare quality with new technologies such as the robot. I, I would just say that for your, I think for in urology, it's a reality, it's a perception by the public, and that, you, that the, the robotic prostatectomy, I think, is the standard of care for that. Again, we have seen that the data is not great, but I think it's also being used as a tool by institutions as well. A memorial. I mean, right at this moment, the, the colorectal department, the policy is they will do all their colorectal surgery, colon ca cases as well as rectal cases with the robot. Now, they have 14 robots. They're getting a few more. And there's absolutely no indication. No one ever made a claim that there was a benefit for standard right colectomy, sigmoid colectomy, transverse colectomy. And yet they're using that because they want to increase their skill set, and they're getting very good at it. But the point is the message that's going out in their advertising is that come here for the latest in, in, in cancer care and treatment. And the truth of it is that is, you know, and I have friends, and I, I play tennis with all these guys. I mean, I'm, we're friends, but I think it's, as the, that is unfair and unreasonable marketing, and it's also setting a standard that the rest of our country even can't match. We can't match the 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 because the, they can they can do that for all their cases and I think we have to watch out how how it is perceived and we, and we can make it worse by by over overplaying the the, uh, the the you know the claims based on just the fact that it's very it's it bells and whistles and it's very exciting to look at and it's very modern. So if I may, real quick, you know we all like to in New York we all like to jump on the fact that Memorial is the 800 pound gorilla. So uh, so so the uh, the interesting thing again and you talk about. Um, economies of scale, for instance, and you, I think Memorial, you mentioned 14, I think they have eight, but the proof pro probably lies in the middle. But, you know, they've made the commitment to switch out. So as you know, there's different, there's four different versions of the robot, but just so that you can avoid different instrumentation because the newest, you know, the newest version, the instruments don't fit on the, the, the former edition. So just to just to avoid the complexity of ordering instruments, so nursing standardized and so forth, you know, they have the ability to say, we're switching out eight of these former ones for the newest version. And so you see that as well at NYU. And so there's the spectrum of the healthcare system, the Tina you just pointed out, where, well, we don't even have a robot or we considered high quality. And then there's the 800 pound gorillas that just switched everything to the newest version to streamline the process so that there's, you know, the, the economies of scale, the efficiency is even greater. I just think it comes back, well, go ahead. And then if there's. Ron, Ron I'm going to say that lie again. Um, just to refer to the 800-pound gorilla, um, I, I, was, I, I was struck by the fact, I forgot which of your presentations showed the slide from Sloan Kettering um, that had, I think, a five-fold variation in the complication rate of surgeons doing prostatectomies. Um, and presumably that's, those are high-quality surgeons and those are surgeons that have a lot of volume, and yet there's a five-fold difference. So I'm struck by the fact that if you just simply monitor the surgeons and improve their quality, you would have a much greater effect on healthcare in, in prostatectomy in the United States than anything a robot's ever been able to achieve. Uh, you, you may know that you know, Harvard Business School has done a case study, and I've forgotten the center in Germany that does all the prostatectomies, um, and they monitor their surgeons very, very closely, and they look at their complication rates, and regardless of seniority, if you're not holding up your share, you get coached by whoever is doing a better job. So again, we've talked about, I, I did the quick calculation, 2,000 times 2 million, I think, you know, $4 billion investment in robots plus the disposables. And if we just made our surgeons better, we'd have, we wouldn't be arguing about changes. We'd have a five, a five times greater effect than anything the robot ever did. Yeah, I, I, could I answer that? So there, you're talking about Martini Clinic, and, and I think that your point is absolutely right on. And there was an editorial by, by Jay Smith in the Journal of Urology, who's a very high volume robotic surgeon from Vanderbilt that was just titled Surgeon Responsibility. Ultimately, it's the surgeons who are doing the operations, not the robot, and the downstream consequences of that relate, you know, it's a system and a team, but, but your point is exactly right, that systematic approaches to quality improvement are probably woefully lacking. And so what we do in Michigan now through the registry we have with our work with Blue Cross Blue Shield is to basically provide back to each surgeon on a quarterly basis, both their comparative quality of life or patient reported outcomes, as well as their comparative perioperative morbidity. And the kind of degree to which that accelerates interest in improvement and commitment to improvement is remarkable. Um, and I think it is going to be just a little bit of time before we can demonstrate its impact. But without that, the ability to kind of improve is, is really difficult. And so I would say 100%, I mean, that has to be, it isn't just measuring the data. It's also acting on it. And there was a recent paper in JAMA from ACS NISQIP that showed the hospitals that, ha that measure the registry data had no difference, you know, 
arguably in the outcomes measured than those that didn't, I think there has to be a feedback loop on the quality improvement. And there are some practices in Michigan where it, it, smaller practices, community-based practices, where there were four people doing the operation, we started presenting data back. There are now two people doing the operation. They've, some of that help happens, you, you hope, organically. But other, you know, there may be other strategies that need to be involved as well. But having the data and feeding it back is essential. Tina was just giving me the high sign. So I, I want to thank the panel. I, not only did I learn a lot, this was great. I, I thought it was a really sparked an interesting discussion, and you all have very good humor about it. And I very, uh, I thought the presentations and the questions were great. So I'd like to thank you all very much. It was great. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I think it's, lunch. Wish you guys. Wish you guys. That is nice. That's nice.